My morning this morning began by having a chance to be able to go upstairs and interact with our children who uh, have been working hard to put coins and save dollars for our building fund. And as I was interacting with all of them, I was just so blessed by the sweetness of the spirit that God has put in the hearts of our children. Certainly the parents and grandparents who have influenced those kids, we, we see that sweetness. And it's interesting because it's a testimony to God's faithfulness because God faithfully speaks the hearts of a parent to bless their children and let them encounter God in a way that makes it real and special. And so the day started that way. This week was a, an amazing week of opportunity. It's connected uh, a lot of what we do and impacting lives here, there, and everywhere uh, into the story of who we are. And I had the privilege of being able to uh, scoot out after our special ordination service last week. I had a chance to go to Ukraine and, and preach the gospel to 100 teenagers and 120 children uh, and also to testify with some widows. And so think about this in the span of a week. Uh, to be able to share in a service with uh, every night with 100 teenagers, and 37 teenagers gave their heart to Christ this week in Ukraine. Is that not a great testimony of God's faithfulness? It was one of the sweetest, one of the sweetest moments. And I got a note from one of the kids this morning uh, from that camp, and she said, I have been praying for God to send someone who would help me understand who he is and what he can do in my life. And she said, I'm so thankful that you're the person that, you are the someone that God sent, sent to help me, and I want to live for Jesus the rest of my life. And as I read that, I thought, what powerful words. But it didn't stop there. I had a chance to be able to baptize a 77-year-old widow and uh, handicapped in a wheelchair and a precious moment of God's faithfulness because this lady had lived through difficulty and heartache and hardship. And she began to realize that she was in a room with some other women who had met Jesus all of them widows. And it began to impact her in such a way that she thought, you know, I want to experience the same Jesus they're experiencing. And as a result, she gave her heart to Christ, and, and it just so happened I had the privilege of being able to be in that nursing home with, with 40 other widows. And it's so intriguing to be around them and interact with them. Obviously, they don't speak any English, but the language of God's love supersedes our tongue and our capacity to speak. And it's amazing to watch what God did in that particular service. Because in that service, one lady who was, who was quite old, and she told me while I was there, she said, I'm ready to die. I want to die. I've lived my life. And uh, one of the ladies who's there who helps take care of nursing home said, uh, you don't want to die yet. Uh, you want to find Jesus just like Maria did. And so she, so she came to service and witnessed and watched what was transpiring. But I wish you could capture in words the faithfulness of God. You see, the truth of the matter is we're called to be faithful, but the reality is God faithfully goes before us, preparing hearts, preparing minds, setting in motion the story of how God wants to work in each one of our lives. And, and I'll tell you what's amazing. When we start encountering God's faithfulness, it does something inside of us. And while I was at uh, camp with these teenagers, uh, something happened that doesn't happen very often at all. I found myself one evening after service, a little girl walks up to me, and obviously she needs a translator, but she walks up to me, a uh, little 15-year-old young lady, and she said, could I pray for you? And I said, well, I thought she wanted me to pray for her. I said, well, I'd be happy to pray for you. She said, no, no, I don't want you to pray for me. I want to pray for you. And I said, you can, you can pray. And she prayed one of the sweetest prayers. And I asked her to go home, go back to her room, and write down the, that prayer so I could have it and then have it translated. And I want you to listen to the words that she wrote that, they, that uh, obviously connect into the faithfulness of God at work in each one of our lives. Dear Lord, my Father... And the Holy Spirit, I thank you dearly for bringing him, me, here, and it isn't a coincidence. I thank you for your work in his heart. You know his physical strength, his spiritual strength. Please help him to see your work in everything, your glory and miracles. Help him to finish the race of his life and receive the crown of life at the end. Return to him all the blessings abundantly from what he has already given away. Help him always to hear your voice in Jesus' name. And when you read that, you realize that here's a child who, I sent a note to the, one of the leaders that said, give me the story, the background of this story. Great heartache, great difficulty, but what? Wanting to pray and intercede and ask God to do something amazing. You see, when I got to camp, I didn't realize I was going to be in the middle of refugees from the Eastern War between Russia and Ukraine. And there were children there that had not been bathed. There were children there who had no water, no electricity, living in the old buildings next to the camp. 
And I began to watch them. And I began to realize that we are all imprisoned until Jesus sets us free. The burden of our sin puts us in a place that just is as challenging as what those little children were all facing, having lost everything they had and being been brought to a place where they would be safe and secure, but also to begin with nothing. And it reminded me of how important it is that you and I understand how faithful God is. And that's what this series is all about. If you'll think through the span of this year, if you've been in service during this year, you realize that we spent the first half of the year talking about how important it is that we are faithful. But more essential than anything else is for us to understand how faithful God is. And I hope that today as we look inside of his word, you begin to sense and feel his presence at work in your life. So I want to ask you a question to begin this message today. Who is the most faithful person you know? Who is the most faithful person that when you think about this person, they stand out to you in such a unique and powerful way? Because what I want to show you is in encountering his faithfulness, it is in our daily pursuit of God that we begin to understand how faithful he is, how he wants to work in our lives, what he wants to do inside of each one of our hearts. And so think about it. The most faithful person that you know, someone that stands out to you, and then you begin to think about, okay, I can identify that person, but then start thinking about the characteristics that describe them best. And I got to thinking about the faithful people that I have known, who, who I've known as a product of God's faithfulness at work in their lives. And I started thinking about the qualities that stand out that are part of my personal journey with faithful people. Because I want to sh- what I want to show you today is, when you get to Psalm 100, it's one of those unique psalms that's completely linked to gratitude. And it's interesting because that's where, when you learn how to be thankful, you begin to experience more of what his faithfulness is all about. Because when you're thankful, your spirit's right, your heart's right, you, you're connected, in, <clears throat> connected into his purpose for your life, and you are start seeing yourself in the light of his faithfulness at work in your life. And what I love about how God works in each, <clears throat> excuse me, how God works in each one of our lives, he has something in store for each one of our journey. We just have to be willing to yield ourselves to him. And so today, as you think about that, I wrote down several qualities. I just want to identify with you and kind of think through. The first one that stands out to me, uh, the, the faithful people God's put in my life is love. Because when I think about those who really live for God, there's just a love about them that is powerful and profound. And I think for me personally, I think about the faithfulness of my grandmother, the faithfulness of other people that I have known through the years. Their love was amazing. But I want, to think, I want you to think about this for a second. Their love, as good as it was, is not a perfect love. And God brings a perfect love into our world when we meet Jesus because we get to encounter his love for God so loved the world that he gave his son. We get to experience the perfect love that comes from him. Second quality was commitment. And when I think about people, they're committed to something. They want to accomplish something. They yield themselves to something. And it's interesting because the psalmist, you'll, you'll discover today that he begins with making sure that we bring joy into our lives. And as we begin to let joy become a part of our story, which is his abiding presence, as his abiding presence begins to work inside of us, something begins to transform how we look at our own commitment, what it is we want to live for. And when I think about faithful people, they're committed to something. What makes one heart special in my heart is that faithful men and women, boys and girls, are a part of the story of who we are. But think about this. Who would we be without God's faithfulness resting on our life? We would be nothing. But when his faithfulness rests on our life, he does something amazing. So, first of all, love and commitment. The third quality is compassion. And when I think about the qualities of those who are faithful that are part of my story, they always yield a compassion that is profound and powerful because compassionate people understand who God is because the God of all compassion speaks to our hearts, speaks to our lives. Another quality that stands out to me is character. And I want to just identify these so you can think through them because when I think about faithful people, they are people of character. They're, they're people of integrity. They have an integrity about their life. They live for something beyond themselves, and that character resonates with the journey of faith that they're on. And so think about for a second. Who do you know is faithful? Do they have these qualities? Do they have honor? And because a faithful person will, will exhibit an honor about who they are, they will recognize the value of who you are, and that value just does something inside of you. And one final quality of those who are faithful that stands out to me is holiness. Because when someone's holy, what happens? They begin to see God the way he intended for them to see him. They begin to experience uh, what, he wa- and what, he, what he meant when he said, Be holy, for I'm holy. And they begin to experience what it means to be faithful in their life. 
And then they begin to encounter God's faithfulness because God, in His perfect holiness, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. What we, we discover is that in this psalm, I want you to take a journey with me. And what I want you to do, I want you to take a journey that allows you to experience and be reminded of how faithful God is in each one of our journeys of faith. Because here's what you discover. When I journey into remembering my salvation, I journey into remembering my encounters with God, and when I journey into remembering what He has done in the lives of the beautiful children, and one of the privileges today was being upstairs and, and watching just the joy that comes to the hearts of the next generation and how precious they are. All those things remind me of how faithful our God is. So look, if you would, in Psalm 100. And I want you to begin at the very last part of this psalm, but then we'll come back and dig into it all. Look, if you would, in verse 4 of Psalm 100. Remember, it's a brief, brief, clearly focused time of application that the psalmist wants everyone to get this idea. When you get grateful, you begin to understand and experience how faithful he is. All right? So look, if you would, verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. And notice this last phrase. And his faithfulness to all generations. He's good. He's faithful to all generations. Now look back, if you would, at verse 1, and let's just see how the psalmist opens our hearts up to experiencing what he intended for our life. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. You see, when you begin to encounter his faithfulness, all of a sudden you begin to experience his incomprehensible love. And what, what the psalmist wants us to grasp and what God wants us to grasp is when we start seeing how faithful he is, how he meets us at places we never dreamed he would and speaks to our hearts in the most vivid and powerful ways, when we start seeing his faithfulness in our life, we start grasping the absolute beauty and power of his love. Because what his love does, his love does something inside of us that no man, no woman could ever do. It's that perfect love that sets us free to experience life the way he intended. It's that perfect love that it's almost incomprehensible for us to grasp because it, it's not defined by someone's expectations. It's defined by his heart. And what you discover is when you and I come to a place where we're not processing things just based on someone's expectations, but instead we're processing things based on the heart of God, then we begin to see his faithfulness as, at work in our lives, and it does something inside of each one of us. So today, as you think about it, I want us to take a, a journey through this psalm. And what I want you to get a hold of is I want you to think about, and you're on, you're on this journey, and you begin to take a few steps, and these steps are all leading you to a place where his faithfulness becomes pivotal to your entire story. His faithfulness becomes a part of what it is that you are looking for the most in your life, because here's what you discover. The more I understand how faithful he is, the more I'm going to grasp his goodness, the more I'm going to grasp his love. And at the end of this message, we'll, we'll look at how important it is that we encounter his goodness the way he intended for it to be encountered. For God is good. He works in each one of our lives in a good way. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. You see, you and I, all we have to do is stop and say, you know what, I want to experience that same kind of encounter that Paul related to in Romans 8, 28, because in, the, in that 8th chapter, in the 28th verse, when you look at that particular chapter, you realize they'd been through difficulty, they'd been through heartache, they'd been through challenges, they'd been through suffering, and Paul brings it back, and says, you know what, even through all these things, all these things, you can trust me that what I'm doing inside of you is there to accomplish and experience the goodness of God, for he is good, he lets all things work together for good, he brings together all the challenges of our lives and allows us to experience him the way he intended. So the first thing I want you to learn is in verse 1 and 2, he brings to light that if we're going to experience his faithfulness the way that God intended, we have to learn how to express our joy. And look, if you would, as you look at that, because when you start expressing your joy, something begins to happen inside of you. Look at verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness. 
come before him with joyful singing. So what he does here is he said he brings to light that as we start living out this joyful life, and remember now, if joy is a product of his abiding presence, the more present he is, the, the more joyful we are, then all of a sudden, in that joy, it opens our hearts up to serve. And we start serving and extending our love. And I, one of the privileges I had today was just to see how many people uh, are engaged all across our complex every Sunday morning, ministering to our children, blessing them, encouraging them. And why do they do that? Because there's a joy in serving the Lord. There's a joy in putting our hearts before Him and saying, Lord, this is what I want to experience with you. And so I want you to think about this. The last time you served, was there a great joy to it? Because as you serve and the joy of the Lord rests on what you're doing, all of a sudden you want to do more. You want to accomplish more. You want to experience more because that joy drives you towards an amazing spirit of service. So he says, serve the Lord, verse 2, with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. And what the psalmist does for each one of us is he helps us understand about what joy does. Because joy connects us and connects our hearts to an eternal song. You see, there's songs that are written by God for our hearts and life, and the Psalms are songs that were written that connected people into their faith journey. That's why Psalm 37 and 27, these different psalms speak to our hearts and lives in different ways. Psalm 23, uh, you could just go through Psalm 90. You could go through them and you realize these songs really grab hold and they say something to the eternal part of who I am. And so I found myself in uh, Ukraine this weekend. They, they were singing, I don't know if you've ever listened to a Slavic language, but it is very different than English. Uh, it is very hard to grasp and comprehend. And so I thought to myself, I'm not going to learn a word of these songs. There's no way. I mean, there's no way to even pronounce any of the stuff they say. I mean, the, the town, that the, the village that I was in is Koroshiti. Now think about spending your life trying to learn words like that. I mean, it was just really, all of them were challenging words. But then I started watching, I started watching as they sang. Now think about this for a second. I watched this young lady who was worshiping God in such a beautiful way. I didn't know until yesterday that she not only came to worship God, she also brought a friend who was reluctant to come and learn anything about Jesus. But guess what happened to her? She saw that eternal song in the heart of her friend Tanya, and it said to her, it said to Karina, that is the Jesus I want to know. And as a result, God touched your heart and life. So think about this. You start expressing your joy. You become joyful in everything that you're encountering, everything you're experiencing. And that joy begins to rest on you. And all of a sudden, you have an eternal song. It's not some temporal song that, that comes and goes. It's a song of the Savior, of the Redeemer, who becomes a part of your story. And you start expressing yourself in the most beautiful way because all of a sudden... You're encountering his presence. And encountering his presence bring to you such a gladness. It was, I was glad when they, we entered into the house of the Lord. The scripture talks about how important it is that we have gladness inside of our life. And what is joy? He begins to abide in us and experience And we start expressing our joy. And I'm going to tell you, that's why when you meet people that express joy, there's something that's, that's absolutely magnetic about it because their joy does something for you. And one of the things I love about serving the Lord, listen, not every day is easy, but every day is good when you, allow, when you allow the joy of the Lord to rest on your life. Because you do not have to let a circumstance define you. You can allow a, convic a conviction to direct you. And the conviction should be, no matter what comes at me, I'm going to trust him to watch over and guide and sustain me in a beautiful way. So the first thing you do is you learn, and you're on this journey, and all of a sudden you just make a choice. I am going to express my joy. I'm going, I'm going to express my joy. I'm going, to, I'm going to convey that to whoever I encounter, and the joy of the Lord is going to rest on my life, and I'm going to watch him work. But it doesn't stop there. Look at verse 3, because in verse 3, he brings to light something very powerful. Know that, in fact, you can't miss this verse. Note the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Wow. The second step of our journey is to understand who he is and how he works. Because if you understand who he is, that he is perfectly faithful, 
and you understand how he works in perfect faithfulness in each one of our lives, then all of a sudden you, you realize it's not defined by some degree of self-sufficiency. It's defined by his presence at work in you. And watch this. If you come to a place where you understand it's not made by you, it's not defined by you, instead it's directed by him, and he's the one who's directed your life, then all of a sudden you begin to see yourself through the right lens. You see, the truth of the matter is, one of the things that I loved about the encounter this week for me was the fact that I couldn't say a single word of their language. But through a translator, the translator could take the English language and convert it into a language. So it was not based on any ability or any capacity I had. It was who he is and how he works and how he reaches in the hearts, the lives of those children. You see, I've not often in my lifetime seen 37 people come to know Jesus in one day. And to watch the joy of the Lord rest on their life as a result of that. But when I remember th- what I remember most vividly is being able to say to them, if you, if you want Jesus to live inside of your heart and life, this is how you do it. If you want that experience, you can do it this very night. And when I began to watch that, I began to realize that it's not me. The truth is, I'm so limited in ability that it would be impossible for me to convey to anyone anything. But the Holy Spirit works in all of our lives to transform how we think, to transform how we live. And so all of a sudden, we start understanding who He is. And that's exactly what the Psalms are trying to get across. Know the Lord Himself is God. In other words, what he's trying to say is don't get caught up thinking you're going to find all the answers even because that's not how life works. Life throws at us lots of difficulties. We're not always going to have the answers. But here's what you discover. He is our God. He knows every detail of our lives. So we don't have to get caught up getting frustrated by this or overwhelmed by that. And, and it's interesting because what I've discovered is the parts of your story that don't read like you'd like them to, for example, product of a broken home, product of an alcoholic, father, product. those things read beautifully to someone who's going through difficulty and heartache. It, it makes the story read out for them to be able to understand that even those who suffer and go through difficulty can turn their attention towards God, turn their attention towards accomplishing what he intends. And so he loves us. He knows every detail of our lives. And, and I love the fact that he watches over every detail. He gives us the opportunity to be able to move into an experienced life in such a profound and powerful way if we're willing to surrender ourselves to his faithfulness and say, Lord, you're going to guide me. Second thing I want you to see, though, is we're created to fulfill his purpose. I mean, when you look at this, you realize something that, that we weren't created. Look at verse 3 there again. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture, which tells you something. What we're created to do is to fulfill what it is he wants to accomplish through each one of us. And so all of a sudden we don't begin to, I mean, we don't start defining our life just by vocational choice. We, we define it instead by a spiritual direction God gives us because as he begins to work inside of our lives, he begins to change who we are. He begins to show us more and more of who he is. And the more we encounter, encounter his faithfulness, the more powerful our lives can be, how more beautiful our lives can be. And what I love about God's faithfulness, it meets us at the point of our greatest need because we all are inadequate. We're all sinful by nature but we come into a right relationship with christ and see that separation that sin does how is it met how is it ever answered it's always answered in our savior because jesus bridges the gap between our sin and our need for a savior and it becomes the righteous that the righteousness that we need to encounter and experience god's best for our life and so first of all you begin to you know express your joy and then you begin to understand who he is and watch this carefully the more you understand who he is the more you understand what he wants to do with you and what he wants to do in you and what he wants to do through you. And then you come to verse 4 where he says you enter his gates. You enter his gates and you walk in there and what, what you discover is that he wants you to come before him with gratitude. Enter his great gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Think about what happens when all of a sudden you start walking into an experience and you walk in there with gratitude. You walk in there saying, you know what, this is what I want to experience in my life. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for everything that has come my way. Everything that makes my story a beautiful story because of the grace of God, because of his faithfulness at work in my life. And so he says, you enter in and you walk in, you come before him with gratitude. And what you discover is the more thankful you are, the more truth is absorbed inside of you and the more truth that you take in, 
the more powerful your life is because when the truth begins to speak to you, it begins to direct you towards encountering what it is he wants to do inside of your life. And so all of a sudden you go, wait a minute now, so what do I need to do? I need to take a few steps. I need to follow him. I need to follow him into his house. In other words, he makes it very clear here. You enter his courts with praise. And you give thanks to him in verse, verse 4. Give thanks to him. You bless his name. So he's identifying that we make these choices to be grateful. We make these choices to express gratitude before God. We keep overwhelmingly step into what it is that he wants to do inside of our lives. We keep expressing ourselves saying, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to come into your house. I want to lift my heart up to you. And when I do that, something begins to happen inside of me. That's why we sang that hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Because if I understand his faithfulness, I understand how he wants to work in me. And my challenge for you today, today is think about, what if you come before him this very day with just gratitude? Not, not caught up by anything that's in your way, not circumstances, not situation, not issues, not even thoughts. So Lord, I just come to you, I'm grateful. Grateful for what you want to do. What will happen is you begin to zero in on experiencing what he intended for your life. And that's what makes life special. And when I understand what he wants to do through me and what he wants to do in me, then what happens? I understand I'm not myself. He is the one who has made me. He is the one who works inside of me. He is the one who directs my steps. And so you come before him. You follow him into his house. The second thing you do, you bless his name for his goodness. You bless his name for his goodness. Because he makes it, in verse 5, he makes this statement, for the Lord is good. And I don't know if you're like me, but I like the goodness of God. Because when I understand that he's good, then I don't have to filter everything through my opinions. I instead yield myself to his goodness. And he is good. And you know, and it's interesting because this particular psalm, it says you enter, the, you enter his house, you, you offer praise to him. And, and I was thinking about how limited my ability is to sing, but how blessed I am by the music that speaks to my heart. And that is God's word being sung inside of me that speaks to how, what good, how good he is, what he wants to do in each one of your lives. So I want you to think about it for a second. What would happen if all of a sudden you began to look at his goodness and say, Lord, he is good. God is good. And then all of a sudden, whatever you're facing, you know what? I'm going to try. I'm going to filter this through the goodness of God. And I'm going to watch him work through that. But it doesn't stop there because he goes on to say, you encounter his love and faithfulness. Because notice what he says there in verse 5. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. I mean, when I think about that, I think about the power of what happens when we start encountering his love in the way he intended. So I wanted you to think about this with me for a moment. Because if, watch this, if we grasp his goodness, we will understand his greatness. If we grasp his goodness, we will understand his greatness. Because he is so good, it's hard to even define and describe the goodness of God. While I was in Ukraine, I had the privilege of being with, uh, uh, with the pastor Peter there who's, uh, who's battled cancer. He's been through lots of challenges. But I would not get back to the house until 11 o'clock at night. And his, in his house, there's a joy about that house that's hard to even describe. And, and so I would get home at 11 o'clock at night, and, and he would stay up. He and his wife would both wait up to see me, and he speaks some English. She speaks no English. And I mean, it's quite intriguing to be eating breakfast with someone speaking to you in Russian, and you're sitting there going, mm-hmm. You keep hoping that they're saying some nice things because you have no idea what they're saying. But at 11 o'clock at night, they're waiting for me, and every night they would have out blackberries, blueberries, strawberries, watermelon, and in the middle of, the, in the middle of that table would be Ukrainian ice cream. And so they, you could tell that they, they were not going to partake of that unless I did. And so I experienced the goodness of Ukrainian ice cream and blackberries. And, and what, what, it, what was cool about the whole story was that all those fruits were raised by a pastor who was driven out at the threat of death from Donetsk, Ukraine. And he came to the Toma region of Ukraine with nothing and worked and labored and built a greenhouse and began to grow those different vegetables and so or the different fruits. And so he would bring those, and so I just felt compelled to experience the goodness of his labor and to experience that ice cream that, that the pastor's wife would put out there. And so the first night, they were like, 
you have to eat more, you have to eat more. I said, I can't eat so much. Said, no, I'm not used to eating sugar. This is really overwhelming. So the next night, I got back and I thought, well, they're going to have something a lot less overwhelming. Guess what we had? Strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, watermelon, and ice cream. All right? So when you think about how sweet that moment was, more than the food that we were partaking of, the sweetness of the fellowship with a faithful man who, even with the diagnosis of cancer, he'll have a smile on his face. You see, when you grasp the goodness of God, you grasp the greatness of God. You understand his greatness. But it doesn't stop there, though. When you comprehend his love, when you all of a sudden begin to comprehend his love, you begin to understand eternity. Because God not only loves us here on earth, he's got provision for us for eternity. And it's going to be the most special time for all of us to be in heaven together when he calls us home. And so if you grasp and understand that, something begins to happen inside of you. So his goodness, his love. And one final thing. If I understand his faithfulness, if I understand who he is, how faithful he is, I'll understand my purpose. And my challenge for you today is this. Think about his goodness. Think about his love. Think about his faithfulness and realize that what he wants to do inside of you is change every part of who you are to experience life the way he intended. That's what brings us into his house every Sunday. That's what allows us to experience his faithfulness. And during these weeks as they unfold, my prayer is that your heart would be open to grasp these things, to understand these things, to comprehend these things, because in his goodness, in his love, in his faithfulness, we get to experience the best of heaven. And so let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to come into your house on this day. Thank you for the privilege of being able to look at a small little psalm that has such power that his faithfulness extends to all generations, every generation. I saw that today in the hearts of our children. I saw that from the, littlest, the least of ones who are here all the way up through kiddos that... I've watched them grow up their entire lives. You are faithful. Your, your faithfulness extends to all generations, and we just have to be willing to think about our own lives and ask ourselves the question, we, will we encounter his faithfulness? Will we daily pursue him so that his faithfulness becomes real to us? Lord, I pray you bless us as we respond to you. There's someone here who needs a church home, someone here who needs to encounter your faithfulness by way of a personal relationship with you. If they've never given their heart to you, Lord, I pray you speak to their heart. Lord, if there's someone here, if they're just looking for someone to intercede for them and with them, I pray you would also speak to their life. Lord, bless